Hi, this is Matt Reisinger with Reisinger Homes. Welcome to my video blog dedicated to building science and fine craftsmanship. I'm here with one of my favorite people, Christoph Irwin from Positive Energy. Uh, Christoph owns a company that does all of our uh, ratings on our houses, also does a lot of our manual J's and uh, kind of pre-work on uh, energy analysis. And then his company also is our third-party tester for both duct blasts and blower door tests, HERS ratings, things like that. Christoph and his crew are really some smart building scientists. And one of his specialties is high performance HVAC systems. And so Christoph helped us design this Mitsubishi VRF system that we used on this brand new construction house behind me. This is a house that uh, was designed by Scott Ginder of Dick Clark Architecture. Christoph, tell us a little bit about a VRF system and how that compares to uh, say a standard system that you've seen used in a lot of our houses previous to this. Sure, sure. Well, VRF stands for Variable Refrigerant Flow, and what that gives it is the ability to vary the capacity coming out of this machine here. Normal equipment, I know you use American Standard, mm -hmm. typically 15 steer, sear, two-stage equipment. Let's say a three-ton unit will have 36,000 BTUs, and that'll go with an unloading compressor about 67% of that. This one, on the other hand, it gives you full capacity. This happens to be a four ton condenser and it'll scale down all the way down to 15% of that capacity and serve everywhere in between continuously. That's pretty cool. Yeah, it's very cool. So Christoph, tell us when, we, when we're designing an HVAC system in Texas, um, tell us a little bit about what's called the manual J and how we decide on the capacity that's needed for the house and how these VRF systems actually meet the demands of a high performance house better than let's say a, a standard uh, two zone, or pardon me, uh, uh, two speed uh, outside compressor. Right. Sorry. A little so, uh, phone call there. turned his phone off there. <laughs> the manual J is often referred to as a load calculation. A word is actually missing there. It's a peak load calculation. This is, rep the manual J load is representative of the peak heating and cooling loads you're gonna see in this climate zone throughout mm -hmm. the year. What that's not saying is most of the time, the vast majority of the time, this building will not see loads that high. It will see loads at what we call part load conditions. This equipment and its ability to give variable capacity will be able to meet part load conditions efficiently, very efficiently. So what's the, uh, what's the design temp that you're using for my houses in Texas on the Manual J, Christoph, for instance? ASHRAE has its 1% Manual J uh, summer design temperature of 98 degrees. City of Austin Amendment has bumped that up one notch to 99 degrees. That's so in effect, when we're, when we're designing a standard HVAC system, we're designing it for the worst day in Austin, so to speak. Correct. Correct. And what ended up happening is that most of the time that air conditioner does not need to run at a full 36,000 BTU because the house sees loads of a certain number of BTUs gained through the windows or gained through the roof, exactly. but it's not always the full capacity, correct? That's exactly right. It's rarely needing full capacity. It needs, by definition, it needs full capacity for 1% of the hours of the year, 87.6 wow. hours a year. And I want to just point out that that design temperature, that is the 1% design value based on a 30-year moving average. We did have a crazy hot summer a few years yeah, back. Yeah, it was, it was over 99 for sure last year. Yeah, uh -huh. So you probably had more than 87 hours above 99, but on a 30-year average, that's the number, and it will bump up if we keep having hot summers. So tell us how a VRF system helps in two areas. I'm most concerned with energy efficiency and comfort for my buildings, and when you're designing a VRF system compared to a standard system, tell us how that VRF addresses those two things, Christoph. Okay, sure. Energy efficiency, we can talk talk energy directly, let's talk through current. The current draw on this machine right here, instead of, uh, let's say it's a normal outdoor condenser, it's gonna kick on with something like 100 amps, locked rotor amps, it's gonna scale down to around the 40s for uh, running load amps. This one's gonna have what's called a soft start all the time, it's gonna kick on around two to four amps, and then gradually ramp up as needed to, I guess the upper limit on this is around 24, 26 amps, I'd have to look at the specs. But so, big difference. Instead of 100 going to 40, we have two to four going to the mid-20s. That's amazing. Um, yeah, it's, it's huge. The, the next thing that's very different about this is the sound. This machine being on right now, we can have a conversation in front of it, and it, it's basically silent. Yeah, very few decibels. That's amazing. Yeah. yeah. So tell us about comfort then. How would a VRF system be more comfortable um, for a client who's considering VRF versus a standard system? This machine and its ability to control delivered capacity can meet indoor heating and cooling needs uh, very precisely and keep the indoor temperature rock steady, uh, plus or minus one degree 
or even less uh, temperature variation. So uh, other machines are going to come on at full capacity. I mean, we all know this. They're going to come on at full capacity. They're going to exceed the set point temperature by a certain amount. Then they're going to shut off. Then they're going to wait for the set point to go low mm -hmm. and fucking in, in um, heating mode there. And then it's going to come back on. It's going to constantly overshoot. Plus or minus three degrees is typical. Yeah, and you've seen me talk about dehumidifiers and the need uh, for dehumidifiers in Texas. A lot of that need is because we're designing these AC systems for the worst day of the year. So if an AC system, a standard AC kicks on, uh, let's say for under 10 minutes, is there much dehumidification that's happening in that system? No, none at all. And why, and why is that? Why is that not getting dehumidification much Dehumidification begins when the uh, indoor coil has enough indoor air moved across it that it cond water condenses on there, drips off, flows through the condensate pipe and it's not until that first drip enters your outside or your drainways vent system that you've actually dehumidified the house. That process is typically at least 10 minutes, 10 to 15 minutes before that starts. Yeah. Before coil temperatures get there. And that's really why it's only a few months of the year really that your air conditioner is running long enough to be able to dehumidify and the spring and the fall typically in most houses in Texas are real uncomfortable because that it, let's say if it's going to be 82 deg degrees outside today which is going to be today's high in May if our set temp inside is 72, we've only got a delta of 10 degrees. It doesn't take very long for a very large, let's say four ton compressor outside if it's running at full capacity uh, to satisfy that. Christoph, I've heard you yeah. talk about uh, VRS systems in comparison to a standard system in a, a car analogy. Will you give us that analogy? Sure, sure, yeah, and then jump into dehumidification too. So let's say we all uh, jump into our truck and drive away from here, and here's the rules. You uh, have to floor your accelerator pedal, and you can use your ignition key to control speed. That's a typical air conditioning system. It's either on, full speed, floored, or it's off. Those are the two speed settings. A dual stage equipment, you'll have uh, a middle set point. So you'll have like floored, half floored, and off, roughly. Mm -hmm. um, so this one, you get an accelerator pedal. You can actually increase or decrease capacity to meet the actual load that the building is seeing. And that ties into dehumidification. This system actually has a dry mode where it's going to scale the fan speed way back, increase the coil temperature, and just go into dehumidification mode. Even without that, normally when it's hitting set points, what it's going to do is it's going to know that it's getting close to set point, so it's going to do exactly that. It's going to scale back on fan speed and lower the coil temperature. That's cool. So uh, one other question, uh, uh, Christoph. One of the things that uh, people think about a lot when they talk about these VRS systems is uh, sometimes they're referred to as mini splits. And a lot of people uh, object to the idea of having a big mini split head on the wall like you see in Europe. Do, do these machines out here have to have a mini split head? Oh, no, no, no. Yeah, it's, that's the big sort of controversy in the industry. People think of variable capacity equipment, they think wall units, many clients react to that negatively. That is not the case. There's many types of ducted equipment that can be used on these machines. Yeah, and in fact, this house behind us, 2,000 square foot, we just have one HVAC system for the whole house tied to this compressor on the outside, and it's a standard upflow. It looks like your standard American box that you'd have in any, uh, in any house. We're able to use our standard April air filter on it. It's a high static pressure, yeah. not a low static pressure. Exactly. It looks like basically any other system except it's got a variable capacity ECM motor on the inside and we've got this VRF on the outside. I know it's, it's tough to talk about energy savings real generally, but give us an idea roughly of what someone might look to save uh, on their annual electric bill, knowing that cooling in Texas is a good 40-ish percent right. of your annual uh, fuel usage in our houses. Can you, give, can you give people a general idea of that, Christoph? Well, based on those current comparisons, just the energy draws, <clears throat> we're usually seeing 20 to 40 percent predicted energy savings just, just by switching this box, this set of boxes for the other set of boxes. That's amazing. One of the things I really like about Christoph and his company, just to, just to give a quick plug for Positive Energy, is if we're doing uh, high efficiency houses, he's able to give me the hard data that shows if we're going to use this standard system versus a VRF system or versus a uh, ground source heat pump, let's say, we can really figure out what those energy uses of those three systems are going to be in a modeling sense. Of course, we can never exactly predict what clients and are going to do. And we them too. Because uh, clients have, uh, you know, multiple TVs in the house sometimes and all these other plug loads that make a difference. Mm -hmm. But through modeling, we can figure out how efficient these systems are. And in fact, we've got a project together right now where we're trying to figure out how much uh, solar it's going to take to get to a net zero. And... Uh, 
one very cool thing about what Christoph's company can do with modeling is we were able to show that um, by using a VRF system compared to a standard system, we could drop 2KW off of, off of a solar system array needed to get a net zero house. Uh, and in the meantime, our, cl our clients are going to be delivered with a very comfortable house. Yeah, th this is top of the line equipment. Very comfortable, very quiet. Really, this is top of the line. And if you're building or remodeling and you've got a new HVAC system, I highly recommend you look into a VRF system. We've been using Mitsubishi. We really like their equipment. There's some other. Let's go inside and we'll show you what this is connected to because I think it's pretty interesting. Most people think of VRF, they think of mini splits. Um, which All is right, we're inside now and look what we found in here. Christoph oh. Irwin in the closet. <laughs> So this is the main mechanical closet for this house. We're in the, we're in the kind of two-story foyer section of this house. Again, 2,000 square foot house. Um, we just have one system in here. So tell us about this, Christoph. What makes this uh, different than most houses in the south? Well, we have, first of all, what makes it the same is you got a box inside with a fan blowing conditioned air. What makes it different is this unit is a four ton. It is not putting out 48,000 BTUs all the time. It's putting out anything in a range, as we said outside, from around 6,000 BTUs up to 48,000, depending on the load that it sees at the time. So it's meeting part load conditions efficiently. This is a closet upflow unit. Mm -hmm. One nice thing about that is you can integrate with your high performance pleated media filters just as usual. Yep. Uh, get everything into condition space. So return airs are down here. It's sucking in the air from here. It's flowing up uh, past that cooled or heated coil. Again, this is a heat pump system uh, and then flowing to the rest of the house. That's really the beauty of this system is we are able to do the ducting like we always do, just like you've seen in my videos. We've got metal trunk lines, metal plenums, and then just a little bit of flex at the very end of the drop. Standard upflow system. This is what we call a high static pressure system. There are uh, lots of other options that you can couple to these VRFs. In fact, we could have uh, put two or three indoor units coupled to that outdoor unit. You have to uh, eight. Up to eight, that's amazing. So we could have zoned off, let's say the master bedroom with a mini split head and the rest of the house with some standard uh, upflow duct work. There's so many options with, the, with these VRS systems. Really, they are um, the Lexus, the really top of the line systems. Yeah, and the, the zoning I wanna point out, it's not like normal zoning where you're using dampers to restrict flow and sending it one way or another. It's completely independent zoning. You have multiple sources of conditioned air inside the house to affect the zone. Yeah, in fact, Christoph has designed a system for me for a, a fairly uh, large uh, house that ha actually has eight different zones. We're utilizing uh, low static pressure units that are servicing one or two rooms each. Still looks like standard ductwork, but each uh, of those eight zones can be controlled separately and we'll have just one or two outdoor units uh, outside in that house. There's so many uh, options with these VRF systems. Yeah. Uh, Christoph, who else makes these besides Mitsubishi who we've been using on these projects? Well, a number of manufacturers make VRF equipment. It's actually 30 year old technology out of uh, Asia and Central America is using it strongly South America and Europe. Uh, locally, Mitsubishi, LG, Daikin are probably some of the big ones that are uh, in the market. And there's a slew more, Sanyo, Sanyo Fujitsu, um, Gri is one out of China. Are any of the other major manufacturers uh, making VRF systems yet? You mean as far as the American manufacturers, yeah. the trains, the carriers, all of them. Uh, I just went to a recent ACA conference and an ASHRAE conference. And it's quite clear that this is the direction that all leading manufacturers are moving. Yeah, and there's some on the marketplace today from some of those big manufacturers, but in my opinion, they're not quite uh, to the technology that especially Mitsubishi has today. So as we looked at some of the other options out there from some of the major brands, yeah. really we felt like Mitsubishi was the way to go, and we're using that on, on several future projects that are in the works or just about to break ground on. Yeah. Christoph, thank you so much for all your help. Pleasure, Always great working with a smart guy like you. Uh, and if you're watching this video and thinking about your new build or your major remodel where you're replacing your HVAC system, I highly recommend you find a contractor who's versed in VRF systems and, uh, and consider that for your house because you will pay a premium for it, but I believe that you will see that premium paid for uh, in energy efficiency and hugely in comfort, yeah. which is always a big thing for me. And controlling humidity and durability in the building, exactly. Those are, those are unbelievably important for me, uh, especially that comfort piece. Thanks for joining me, everybody, and we'll see you next time.